technology. And um, so this should be streaming live onto our YouTube channel. So if you are looking for it or want to recommend it to some family later, you can send it. That'll be on Benoni Bible Church's YouTube channel. And um, I think some of the family that are tuning in probably from Nelspreit and elsewhere um, also welcome through the mobile platform. And uh, yeah, greetings to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is good that we are able to come together to remember a loved one, a family member and a friend. And, a, and so in that, with that in mind, let us open in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that we have the privilege of being here today. Thank you for the life of Michael. We thank you that we can remember him in this way. Thank you for his friends and for his family that are with us. And we do pray that you would be exalted even in a time like this. We pray that you would help us with the technological means and all the means that we use this morning. We do pray that you would be exalted and that as we remember his life, that we would turn from that remembering the, the creator who has given life and who takes life. And we pray that today would even be a solemn occasion for us as individuals to, again, think through life and think through death and think through these important areas um, that, that we might be able to answer before you one day, O oh Lord, and, and be ready for the time that you even take our own lives from this earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome to one and all and uh, welcome to Benoni Bible Church. We've gathered here this morning in memory of Michael Berryman, who departed this earth very recently and very suddenly. And so it may have even come as a shock to many of you, his friends and his family members. Memorials or funerals are always a sad occasion. You can't escape from that, and it ought to be sad. Death is something that is unnatural. It's something that entered this world when Adam and Eve sinned against God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and that is experienced in so many different ways. It is experienced within families, and it is experienced even from Adam and Eve themselves when their one son murdered another son, and you can see what destruction sin brings. And so memorials are a sad occasion. But it's also fitting that you, his friends, his family have gathered together and also are lending sympathy towards and encouragement towards those that are the bereaved, and especially the parents and the, the family members, the immediate family members, sisters. In Job 2 verse 11, it says, now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon them, they came together from their own place. They made an appointment together to come to show their sympathy and to comfort him. And so we see even in the scriptures, that this is something which was, which is good. In Romans 12, verse 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so in an occasion like this, it's a weeping occasion. And not a single word, and let me put that before you this afternoon, that not a single word that is said at any funeral or at any memorial service has any bearing on the eternal destiny of even the deceased. Therefore, funerals are not for those that have died. They are really for those that are living. It's for those that have gathered. We leave such things in the hands of God, but it is good for us to ourselves examine our own lives and to pay respect in such a way to the memory of Michael by turning towards the one who is the creator of heaven and of earth, the one who gives life, the one who takes life. And so we leave these matters in the hands of God and in his divine will. Have you ever heard the statement, um, live it up, live life to the full, because life is short? Well, this, this afternoon, we're going to look a little bit more at that in our scripture reading and in our sermon. But before we head to that, let us go to our first hymn. Won't you stand as we sing our first hymn, How Great Thou Art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder 
consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think of God, his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and lead me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow with humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. I'm going to ask that you be seated and we're going to leave amazing grace for the end. I'm going to be preaching now to us the sermon and then we'll go to our eulogies and thank yous. And then right at the end we'll sing amazing grace with one another. It is wonderful to sing such truth with one another. So have you heard that statement, well, live it up or live life to the full because life is short? And there's lots of such great statements that we're told on how to do that. And maybe we're even told, well, throw caution to the wind, you know, just do whatever your heart desires to do. And maybe even times there's pastors or Christians that might say such things. Give me one moment as I make sure that this thing is working and not muted. I think that that is perfect. Good. Right? Great. That is live. <laughs> Good. Sorry to the live audience for that, but you know, uh, you don't want to risk them getting nothing the whole, the whole way. But you may have been told about this, you know, throw caution to the wind, live it up. But the Bible tells us that such type of a living actually leads towards destruction. The Bible says that there's a way that seems right in the eyes of a man, but its end is destruction. If you're told just do whatever your heart wants to do, that would be a lie that the evil one would have you believe. We are to be those that do what God tells us to do. We are to be those that do what his word tells us to do. It may be, dear one, that you're here today and you've been doing things your way, that you've been going the way of your heart. And you would probably see a trail of destruction. And you've been ignoring your creator. Well, today is a day that you may look again toward God's word. How can a person really live their life to the fullest? Well, according to the scriptures, 
This question is answered by having Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And the Scriptures teach us that having Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and your Savior is the only way to actually live life really to the fullest. We tend to believe the lie of the evil one that, you know, one day when you're old, you can maybe become a Christian. You know, just do what you want. And you'll see how destructive that is in your own life. We have only one life to live, and soon it is past. Only those things that are done for Christ are those that last. See, true purpose is found in the Scriptures from the one who made us. We are made for His glory. And the only way to live for His glory, dear ones, is to have that salvation work of Jesus Christ applied on our account. Because we are all born sinners. We need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. Is He your Savior today? Our focus this afternoon will be on three considerations from James chapter 4, verse 13 to 17, that you might live life to the fullest. And my hope this afternoon is that there would be this solemn contemplation on life. In doing this, you will be honoring the memory of Michael. I'm going to speculate just a little bit, but I do think that if Michael were to suddenly presence himself before us this afternoon, he would say something like this, friends, family, there are many things in this life that distract you from that which is most essential. I can see clearly now of what is most essential. Often you might even let the things that are important cloud out the things in your life that are most essential. I think that he would call on you to soberly and to solemnly examine your own lives this afternoon, recognizing the sovereignty of God in having you in this room, that you might look and see, am I, am I focused on that which is most essential in my life? With that said, let's look at our text for this afternoon, found in James chapter 4, verse 13 to 17. God's word reads, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Just so far in God's word. What a passage for us to consider this afternoon. Our first consideration, and there's three that we're looking at, is firstly how short life is. That's what, part of what we see here. We tend to think, and I think especially those that are younger, tend to think that there's a level of invincibility in life. We're reminded when a friend who is only in his 40s has his life end. And we, we tend to think about death at that point, but then we put it out of our minds again until maybe the next funeral or the next memorial. But dear one, we would be foolish not to consider how short life is. And God's word teaches us this. James asks the rhetorical question, what is your life? And then he gives an answer. He says, it's just a mist. It's just here for a little while. It appears just a, a little while and then it's gone. I used to live in Middleburg and Pumalanga. And there's quite a bit of fog and mist on that road in the early mornings if you're going between there and Pretoria. And it can be actually quite dangerous and even fatal. But I'm reminded of that type of a mist. It's there in the morning, but then suddenly it's gone. And James says, that's our lives. That's how brief your life is. And the um, Afrikaans have a statement for candy floss, work awesome. And it's almost like that, right? It's just and gone. On a very cold day, you breathe out, and the warm air is there, and you can see it. And when you're small in primary school, you always pretend you're smoking, because apparently that's cool when you're in primary school. But it's this point. It's there, and then gone. 
At best, life is way too short. There's a psalm written by Moses who, was, who lived until around 120 years old. And he writes this in Psalm 90, verse 12. He says, so teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. It is wise to number our days, to realize just how short life is so that we might live life in such a way that is glorifying to God. Our God does not measure time like we do, not one bit. I mean, 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says this, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He doesn't measure time like we do, and he knows when your last day on earth is coming. And every day that you live is one day closer to that last day. It's one breath less, every breath that you take. So let me call you towards this consideration. Maybe you're young, maybe you're beautiful, but let me tell you, it fades. Some of the older folk might be able to tell you that today. Maybe you have a level of strength, but you don't need to be any specific age. Death doesn't have a distinction or look at exact things. You might have somebody who's terminally ill who lives for years and somebody else who goes into hospital one day and the next, they're gone. And this leads us to our second important consideration this morning, not just how short life is, but then how easily life can end. Life ends far too easily. There's a thousand ways that people can die. James says this in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And he's saying it's arrogance to actually just believe that life and the control of life is in your hands. He's saying instead you ought to realize not just with how short life is, but just how quickly it can end and then say, if the Lord wills. God's the one who's sovereign over life and over death. So often there's very little that we can even do about death. We may even have good hospital plans or good medical aids, but none of that can actually keep us from death. Most of us don't even have the privilege to plan for it. Do you know that there are people that do plan for it? And we ought to if we're numbering our days. It is inevitable. Pastors actually think about death quite a lot. I've got my sermon passage that I want to have preached at my funeral. My wife knows about it. There's a whole file for her knowing about this is what's to be done. I've even got a plan for the church about what pastor they should call in the interim. Pastors think about this. There was one pastor, an older man, Richard Morley, who was the pastor at Middleburg Baptist many years ago. And he had a, a file that he sent to a, a friend of mine, another pastor, who was to do his funeral. And when I became the pastor at Middleburg Baptist, he called me up and he said, is Richard Morley still alive? Because I've still got his funeral file in my drawer 15 years later. We do not understand and we certainly don't have all of the answers. Even this morning, even in a sermon like this, I can't give you the answers for what God's secret purposes were with Michael. We don't understand. We don't have all the answers. It is if the Lord wills that we live or that we do this or that. The very strength you have to do what you do is given to you by the Lord. It's good for us to recognize that, that we might bow before him. And sometimes a person might be given over to even a debilitating disease and co can no longer do this or do that or eat this or eat that. The very breath that they inhale to be able to formulate even a word of insult or a sinful word in the mouth, that is even given by God. And it's given by the decree of God. He even allows that. The very spit that you would spit up in the face of God would be spit that he allowed you to form in your mouth. Realizing all of this brings us to a holy reverence, doesn't it? And a holy humility before God. Dear one, the casket, and he has a bit of a scary thought, the casket that will hold your earthly remains might be sitting back at the funeral home today, already made. Are you prepared for that? 
Or the pine box that will hold your ashes may have already been made, just waiting for your ashes to be placed in them. We are most foolish not to contemplate this and think through the eventuality of dying and then meeting our maker. It's possible, altogether possible, that the Berryman family gives me a call next week and says, hey, you know this person that you saw at the memorial for Michael? They're needing a pastor to do a memorial for them. They were there last week. Are you available next week for another memorial? Life can end any time. It may be that you read in, about this pastor that you saw <laughs> at a memorial who happened to just suddenly die. The comfort that we have is that God is all wise. His ways are not our ways. Not only is he sovereign, but he is good in his purposes. Isaiah 55 verse 69 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Amazing how the unrighteous person is known by the unrighteous thoughts, right? Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abide abundantly pardon. Is it maybe that you're seated here today thinking, I'm too bad to be forgiven? God's word says otherwise. And then he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And in particular, that is said in context of his saving power when you've turned to him. If you think that your thoughts are way too wicked, take them to God. If you think your life is unforgivable, there's nobody unforgivable before God and what Jesus has done for people like you and me on the cross. Not only are we to consider how short life is and how easily it could come to an end, but thirdly and lastly this morning, we consider how we ought to live purposefully. How we ought to live purposefully. And I'm taking that from the last piece of our passage in verse 16b to 17, where James says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. And he speaks about boasting and doing whatever we want to do without the consideration of the sovereignty of God. And he's really pushing us towards living purposefully. And he says, if you know what you ought to be doing and you don't do it, that's sinful. So even this morning or this afternoon, you may be hearing the message like this, and you know in your mind, it's good for me to make right with God and to turn toward Jesus Christ and to start living life for his glory. Dear one, if, if that's you and you're actually thinking about your own life, just look for a moment at the mess that you've made of your own life, doing things your way. You need a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died so that we might live, and he rose again from the grave victorious that we might have a relationship with God. A person who does not contemplate this with confession and contriteness before the Lord, thinking on the brevity of life and the fact that God's all-powerful and has given them life to live for his purpose, is a fool to not do such things. James says, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let me encourage you, dear ones, to not boast about tomorrow. You don't yet have tomorrow. God's the one who holds our tomorrows in his hands. We ought to be those that live for his glory. Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, do not boast about tomorrow. Living purposefully, living to the glory of God is not living to our own vain glory. And what a difference a day can make. I'm sure that you're thinking through that even as a family and as friends. What a difference a day can make. Do what you can today. That you might not have regrets before God. And I'm reminded even of the thief on the cross. What a difference a day can make, right? He's there right next to the Lord Jesus. And he, one of the other, the other thief is busy mocking Jesus. And he tells the other one, you be quiet. This man doesn't deserve to be here. And then he turns to the Lord. He says, remember me when you're coming to your glory. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. What a difference a day can make. And I remember the story even of the demon-possessed man who called himself Legion. 
Jesus and his disciples cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side. There was a storm. Jesus came walking to them in the storm and he calms the storm. They get to the other side and there's this man who was naked in the tombs, running around, cutting himself. People couldn't hold him down. They try to chain him up. He broke the chains and Jesus gets there and he casts the demons out of this man. It's that same day they go back. What a difference a day can make. That man became one of the first missionaries to 10 Greek cities. Jesus making all the difference, freeing a man like him. It may be that today is that day for you, where you may turn to the creator and the sustainer of all things, that you might fall before him. If you don't even know how to pray, then you ask him to help you to pray. And you say, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned, I've erred, I've went away from you. How can we live purposefully this morning, dear ones? Make it your mission to firstly help others. If we truly love God, it is seen by us loving each other. We serve the Lord by serving one another. And then we ought to be preparing souls for eternity, preparing our own souls for eternity, but then preparing the souls of others, husbands with wives, wives with husbands, your children's souls, the souls of your friends and your family that is around you, taking God's word and trusting in his word and giving his word to others. Preparing souls for eternity is how you live purposefully, but then to turn toward the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might truly live. How many of you gathered here before me are busy in yourselves with things that seem right in your own eyes, but actually their end is destruction. God has laid out for us in his word how we ought to live. Let us do that. Only God knows your heart this morning or this afternoon. And it's for you and him to do that searching of your own heart, seeking to honor the memory of a life of a loved one and a friend by yourself, making sure you live purposefully to the Lord and his glory. But if you're living simply in the moment and you're not for one moment lifting your head up and considering eternity, then that's living like a fool lives. The Bible tells us that. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. That's the fool. If you're preparing your own soul for eternity, that's a living like the wise live. This is solemn. This is good for us to consider. This is a moment that could be a moment of change even for you. Then there can be glory from ashes even in your own life. I'm going to ask you a very important question. Are you ready for it? And you don't need to stick up your hands. You know, I don't like to put people too much on the spot. Now I've really got your attention. Are you alive this morning? Are you alive? Well, if your answer is yes, you know, maybe if you've done this big deep breath suddenly, <gasps> okay, wait, I am. Maybe you didn't realize. If you're alive this morning, then are you making this essential thing the most important thing in your life? living to the glory of God. Realize that only Jesus' person and only Jesus' finished work on the cross can please the Father in heaven on your behalf. Have you found Jesus? Are you found in Jesus today? Jesus tells a story about a rich man and a man named Lazarus. And that story teaches us that life is much more than possessions and title and property but it is about serving the Lord. If you could gain the whole world, the Bible says, but then forfeit your soul, what does it profit you? It's not what we have, but it's who we have that makes all of the difference in the end. And dear ones, you can't take anything with you. The Egyptians tried that and they just got robbed. You know, I mean, all of their pyramids Grave robbers came in and took everything that they wanted to take with them. You can, however, take friends and family with you. You can make an impact while you're this side of the grave. In conclusion, there are two things that we cannot escape as human beings. One being death and the other being judgment. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says this. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after comes judgment. 
Either the judgment of sin must be paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf as a sinner, or you will need to pay for that. And the wrath of God then rests on you for eternity. People think that Jesus in his saving work saved us from sin and Satan and self, and he does. But that which he saves us from the most is our God problem. If you're still in your sin and you haven't got Jesus having paid your debt for you, the biggest problem you have is a God problem, a holy God who you must give an account to. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So then, dear ones, let us use our time wisely in preparing for death and for judgment. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14 says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Have you ever wondered what your duty is? This is the whole duty of man. Fear God, keep his commandments, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So may the Lord add his blessing to his word this, mo this afternoon and grant you much peace as you consider these solemn considerations as we remember the life of a loved one. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we've considered your word, and your word is infallible, it is inspired, it is true, and as we consider that this morning, we pray that you would help us as individuals to seek you out. It may be, Lord, that there are some this, this afternoon here that know that their life is not right with you, and I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help them to turn to you. Give them the courage to, to take a step toward you in faith. Thank you that you say that you do draw near to those that draw near to you. You have promised us in your word salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. If only we would look. If only we would come. And so we do pray, O oh Lord, that you teach us to be those that are wise, that number our days, that recognize the brevity of life, how quickly it can end, and then live very purposefully to your glory. We do pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'm going to now call on Michael's sister, I believe, no, um, on Doug Archibald to do the eulogy. You got very nervous there, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I'm going to ask that you plug this onto your shirt just so that the live stream, let me just do that for you quickly, just over there. Get you dressed. There we go. Yeah, I'm stepping on this cord already. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This eulogy has been written by Linda, Michael's sister. Um, and so, what mattered the most to Michael Berryman, according to his youngest sister? If his day was one worthy of alcohol that he never drank then Michael's escape would be his PlayStation so he could shoot things. He lived in his games and enjoyed showing me, being Linda, around online whenever I wandered into his bedroom. His dogs mattered, and there was never an expense too high to pay to keep them healthy or a tennis ball too expensive to buy for them to destroy in a matter of seconds. Thirdly would be me. While I focused on my writing, Michael took over full duty as the breadwinner. I had food, a computer that worked, medicine when I needed it, whether it be burn gel at seven in the evening or a strange herbal concoction I had seen at Diskin and wanted to try. Michael was my company when I wanted to watch my shows that he had no interest in watching, yet he did. The only time I knew he was vaguely interested in, in the show was if he would suddenly blurt out his predictions on what would happen. He was always wrong. Michael was a volunteered reader to my attempts at writing stories. He read every cringeworthy story and never complained once. If I wanted to quit chasing my dreams, he would tell me things like, don't, keep going 
Well, you're a worthy investment and I'm proud of you for always trying and sitting in front of your computer. He never once told me to hurry up and finish so he could stop supporting me. Voicing his needs were always second to him and if I didn't figure it out, then he would try and keep quiet, which is why his obituary sounds like it is all about me, because that is the person he was. Selfless right until the end. He hated relying on me when he was sick. He wanted me to chase my dreams and he did everything he could help to get me there. As I am now in tears, I will be ending my brother's eulogy, knowing my brother is here with me, still wanting to help me, because that is who he was, genuine and family first. Now it is my turn, Michael, to show you that your sacrifices did not go to waste. Thank you. Linda. Yeah, you wanna take this? Thanks, Doug. Where do you put it? Um no, I've just got it tucked in. Okay, don't tuck it in. Sorry, let me oh, okay. Okay. put it right over there. That should work. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to take this off. Oh. Sorry, I can't breathe. I'm just going to read the eulogies from his, um, from Michael's um, sisters and his mom and father and um, brother in law. Jessica Gilbert is his sister. I always remember Michael as a gentle giant. He always was very protective over us girls. He was always there to help us in any time we needed him. And he would give us the last of anything he had without hesitation. I love you, Mark, and I am devastated that you are not around. I will keep on protecting your, your girls for you and look forward to seeing you one day. <clears throat> This is from Lincoln, um, Lincoln Gilbert, which is Jessica's husband, the brother-in-law. Mark, I'm going to write this in the first person because I know that as a brother in Christ, we will meet again. Often people say that when a person passes away at 80 plus, he had a good innings. And if you die relatively young, we are a bit of a loss for words. Here it is how I see it. The Lord gives all his children gifts. These are to be used to his glory in bringing people to him. Mark, you were given the gift of loyalty, protection, and compassion. Brother, you use these gifts in abundance, and you were loyal to your family, to a fault often, to your own expense, never expecting anything in return, just because you were Mark, and that's what he did. Protecting your family was in instinctive. A guy once tried to get a bit fresh with one of his sisters at a disco. A gentle nudge in the chest by you re resulted him in landing on his butt. You never showed off your physical strength, only when your dad tried to wrestle with you. You were the only person I ever saw pick up dad and squeeze him until he begged for mercy. <laughs> I loved your soft, soft and generous heart, but thank you for being a, a fine uncle. Amber and Kelly adored you. Jesse loved you so much, and I'm sure that when you Heard Jesus say, Michael, welcome home, good and faithful servant. You had tears of joy. Enjoy the fellowship of the saints until we meet your brother Lincoln. <clears throat> Sorry, just got to compose myself. Amber. Amber Gilbert is the niece of Michael. This is my Amber poor eulogy. <laughs> to always be remembered as my uncle that I could bond with best. When it came to our interests since I was a small child, one of the most exciting things to hear was that I was going to see Auntie Linda and Uncle Mark. I am forever grateful to you for the laughs, smiles, and memories you've given me until we meet again. This is from Edna Berryman, which is his mother. In loving memory of my son, Michael, 
What most stirs my heart was your sense of humor. Even as a little boy, you woke up with a big smile on your precious little face. There was always laughter with you. Once a radio man mentioned the word Egypt, you said, Jess, the man said, eat chips. I always treasured your cute ways. They looked, they locked in my heart. Your strong arms that hugged me and lifted me off my feet. Your teasing yet joking nature. Also how you took your sisters under your protection and gave them shelter. We do thank you, God, for being in our lives and that you are his child and safe in his arms. We are now in his care and receiving Jesus. Many blessings and a perfect rest. We always love you and remember you, Mum. From Glenn and the Llewellyn girls. That's a stepmother and the children. And stepsisters. Michael was a great joy to Graham and myself and to his friends. We loved him dearly and he will be sorely missed. And everybody has said the rest for us. So I don't have to say any more. God bless you. I have a message from Jackie from uh, Australia. She sends love and wishes to Uncle Graham, Jess, Linda, and Amber. And okay, thank you.